another edition of Turned Out of Punk. I'm your host, Damien Abraham, and once again, I'm bringing you a conversation with someone who grew up listening to punk, may or may not still be involved with punk, but had their life changed by the genre in a major way. And today on the show, huge one, ginormous one, Daryl Jennifer from the Bad Brains, from Stealth, from White Man Dingoes, from the Bad Brains, Let's like you know, one of the most important <laughs> bands of all time. Uh, and we talk about a lot of stuff. This is a, oh, this is, this is a good one. I'm excited for you to hear this. But first, if you want to get in touch with me, head over to the email address, turn it a punk podcast at gmail.com. That is run by my brother and show producer and guest booker extraordinaire. Thank you, Tristan, for all the hard work you do. And thank you very much to my manager, Brian Schwartz for the assist on this one too. Um, but yeah, they, they, they made this happen. So thank you them for this. Uh, and, uh, they will get the, just can get the message to me that way. You can also find me on Twitter and Instagram at left for Damien. The podcast also has an Instagram at turned out a punk. And that is also run by Tristan. So you can find me uh, through those places. If you want to support the show, the best way to support the show is by telling your friends about it. You can also subscribe to it and rate it if you're listening to it on iTunes. Thank you to everyone that does do that. Uh, you can also support the show by heading over to patreon.com slash turned out a punk. And really huge thank you to the people that do that. And, uh, you know. Uh, really thank you for supporting the show and speaking of support, this show would not be possible with the kind loving support, the fine folks at Vans who came aboard a few years ago and said, Damien, let us help cover the cost of this thing. And they do, they help me cover the costs, which has been phenomenal. <laughs> Allow me to keep doing this thing. And so, uh, and I can't wait till we can all go back to doing uh live things again. And then, you know, go into the house of Vans and hopefully be able to do some live podcasts and stuff. Cause uh, yeah, looking forward to that. Getting out of the house. Hoo, hoo, hoo. But in the meantime, you know, I'm having a lot of fun. I'm having a lot of fun uh, doing the podcast. And thank you for each and every one of you that uh, tune in to all these episodes that are going up there. And hopefully uh, we're keeping it interesting because, man, it's definitely really interesting for me recording them. Holy. All right. Speaking of interesting, today on the show, Daryl Jennifer. Daryl Jennifer is someone who... I've always wanted to talk to like this. I met him briefly when I was a kid at a stealth show when stealth played as part of snow jam and uh, very nice, but it was a very brief conversation. Uh, so to be able to sit down with him like this, Oh, that's why I do this thing. And uh, we go deep on all sorts of stuff. This is a, this is a really fun conversation. Uh, yet I don't know, like check out the bad brains. It just seems like ridiculous to have to say that because if you have not checked with the bad brains, you're really missing out on something. Uh, I, the only note I have to get to before the episode starts is actually the, the infest festival that Daryl brings up that, you know, we, I've said, I've never heard of. I have subsequently researched and yes, indeed it did take place in Canada and my gosh, I cannot believe I did not know about this festival. This is one of the most ridiculous lineups ever for a concert. I can't believe this thing. Anyway, I will be talking about this on Turned Out of Punk Footnotes, I'm sure, at some point with Chris O'Toole. Uh, so if you're on Patreon, I'm sure you will hear this discussed. But uh, what a show. Holy, what a show. Anyway, what a show also with this podcast. Sit back, relax, and enjoy Daryl Jennifer on Turned Out a Punk. All right, Daryl, thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah, man, thanks for thanks for recognizing Bad Brains. You know what I mean? It's it's been a lifetime for for us. Well, I'm I was just about to tell you this off air, and I spared you from it, so I wouldn't have to repeat it. But I think without the Bad Brains, none of this would be happening. You know, like I I've been lucky enough to be playing music as my job professionally for like 20 years now and i wouldn't be doing it without you guys and i and i'm not just speaking for myself like it's it's hard to imagine a world without your band and it's and i mean that in the most positive way possible that thanks man but that's funny you say that because just this morning when i was waiting to do this interview with you i was listening to um chikoria mm -hmm. who recently passed away and um you know, I had been doing some work with Lenny White, the drummer from Return to Forever. And I was sitting in my studio and I was like, I, I was like, man, I want to be able to tell Chick. Without Chick, then there was no me in my whole life. And my whole life has been bad brains or music. But 
Return to Forever and the magic of Chikoria was my and, and Lenny White and Stanley Clark and those guys. That's what they mean to me, you know. So I guess this is a big tapestry of musical love that's that we have going on here. Absolutely. Well, and I think that's the reason I started this podcast is because it gives me an opportunity to to tell people how much their music meant to me, but then to also ask them all the nerdy questions that I wouldn't have sure. an opportunity to ask them otherwise. Yeah, man. Go ahead. Shoot them. <laughs> okay. Well, I got to start this off the way they all start off, which is, Daryl, how did you get into punk? Do you remember the first time you ever came across the genre? Well, I think I got into punk naturally from like being a kid back in the 70s that's about music like music like, there was no djs or rappers back then so in my hood it was like sports or you played guitar drums you know that was the thing mm -hmm. so so you know i wanted to play guitar from an early age and um and wanting to play guitar i guess i just didn't really want to stick with what i was supposed to be playing you know what i mean i had sort of a an adventurous musical um you know i had adventure with music so like you know in my where i'm from it's like go-go it's like r&b it's motown it's it's soul music you know but for me for some reason i was like man you know i used to they used to say daryl you listen to a white boy radio station and stuff you know what i mean but it wasn't <laughs> nothing racial it was just that i feel like now that i look back that i was kind of blessed with like a versatile taste at a very young age so when I discovered punk, right, I thought, wow, you know, it was really exciting. Some of the first records I heard, like The Damned and The Ramones. And, but I remember feeling, because I was kind of shy, you know what I mean, as a, as a player. And then I thought, wow, like punk rock was kind of showing me I didn't have to be all, you know, virtuistic and all that. I, it was mainly about, like, having something to say with my musical expression within my capabilities that's what attracted me to punk you see what i'm saying so i went on to invent my own punk but yeah. the thing about it was because i liked return to forever and all the you know the musical chops and stuff that those guys were bringing back in that day i felt like i had an advantage musically um to be able to create my style of punk with maybe a little bit more technical or but it was all natural that's the next thing when i look back at I never, no one in Bad Brains, we never sat down and said, we're going to do this or be that. Or, we were just a teenage man like everyone else. But we had this, this, it was a perfect timing for us, you know, because being some 70s brothers and then discovering the freedom of punk rock and then being adventurous with creating our own style of punk rock. Like you can even notice in a song like Sailing On how it like, it's like speeding along with these little breaks and stuff. Then at the end, it kind of plays like a lovely major seventh chord. Mm -hmm. To be like, I just give thanks. It's not nothing contrived or nothing we sat down and thought. But as I look back, I think, man, that's cool that, you know, being a spiritual cat, that the, the great spirit gave us the courage to say, yo, we're going to play fancy shit. And then if we want, we could just start playing reggae. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> so that's the blessing to me. In long, yeah. Well, yeah, no. In reading interviews with you over the years, I've always been blown away by how just musically versed you were at such a young age. You know, like you're talking about, you know, even pre-punk stuff, like the stuff that you're into. You, like, you're, you, in addition to being into, you know, all sorts of stuff, you're also into the stuff that you kind of call doomsday music. What I read uh, with, like, you know, Black Sabbath. Oh, and oh, all that stuff. oh, yeah. Well, you see what it was with that, right? Which probably has a lot to do with how I view, because I'm not. I'm not a musician, you know, I'm a guy with a um, a knack to play a bunch of instruments and, you know, I want to do it. It's not like a, a, a musical thing to me. So, so like, um, like there's Led Zeppelin and then there's Black Sabbath, mm -hmm. right? So now like Black Sabbath, like Sweet Leaf and, and, and Iron Man, you know, that I was like, as a young dude down in DC, black dude in the hood. That to me seemed like like a darker, harder. That's why I said doomsday sort of riffs, whereas where Zeppelin felt more technical, happy sometimes. You know, blue. You know, you know mm -hmm. Zeppelin. Everybody. Oh, absolutely, yeah. So, you know, being in the seventies and you and you you wanting to play guitar or bass and you wanting to play various styles, which that's to me now as I look back is the key: wanting to play various styles. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of cats that I grew up with and musicians in all walks that kind of stick to what they're, you know, like what they're supposed to in their hood play or their culture or their race. 
Whereas I never really thought about any of that. I was just mainly peeping riffs and you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So the so so the rock riffs of, of Black Sabbath, that's like that a lot of that, like the bad brains to me being I composed, you know, the riffs and shit, me and Dr. No. But the bad brains riffs in punk, it's like the Ramones and the um the damned and then like Black Sabbath me being the the godfather of that whole approach to us. You see what I'm saying? So when I go to formulate or figure my own style riff, it's basically coming off a sweet leaf. <laughs> Not so much even Hendrix, you see what I'm yeah. saying? And like, we don't do, you know, the blues thing is, which I always found odd as years went on and I look back, it's like Bad Brains never really did the blues based like riffage. Although I did kind of slip some in a little bit in the, on the Eye Against Eye album. But, um, yeah, man, it's to me now that I look back, it's just all about being blessed with a with a sense of versatility, like, you know, yeah. No, and I think that's the thing is, you know, like your your cells, there's like certain groups throughout music history that there's there's no precursor to. Like you can't hear where the influences clearly come from, but I guess that's where that's where that alchemy is, where you're pulling in all these different disparate things and creating, you know, your own type of punk, as you said. Yeah, it's it's about playing what you like. You see, that's a good cool thing about punk because it showed like, you know, imagine you're a kid in the 70s and you want to you play guitar, you want to play like guitar heroes. Mm-hmm. Then all of a sudden you hear like there's a music with a, a real positive in or or a negative energy. It's energy back then, but it's like not necessarily attached to like virtual, you know, virtualistic, you know. Yeah. It's 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 attached to having something to say and saying it and being creative and that's what i believe punk rock did to us in dc was show you know it showed us that yo you can make your own thing i love it you know I, i'm just talking about it it makes me feel like smile you know it's like it's like make whatever you, like whenever i sit down and write some music or make make a, a track or a riff i always think that i think first what what do you what do you want to do like sometimes I say I want this shit to start like a brick wall, or I want this to feel like like confused, or I want this to feel you know what I mean? It's yeah. a way of feeling I want it to feel. Then I and then I interpret it, you know, on the fretboard, which I know shit about music, A minor, B, and all that stuff. I really don't know a lot of that, but I do know the spacings and the and the you know how how they feel. I'm I'm just now starting to learn like with like major and minor, you know, I mean, the difference of how they feel and what they mean. And I never really dawned, you know, none of this stuff never really, it wasn't any fun, I guess, for, for me as a young, <laughs> you know what I mean? The fuck I want to be thinking about all this shit for when I can just like do my thing on this fretboard with these frets and these spaces and these dots. Well, I think that's the thing, you know, you guys really bring to punk rock is this virtuosity, you know, and it's not like, you know, like you're saying you're not into virtuosity. And so it's not virtuosity in like knowing the notes, but it's like a virtuosity and you still take this super seriously and you do it to the best of your ability. And that's why to me, you're an uncoverable band because no one can kind of match your approach to these songs just because it's, it's just so virtuistic in its own kind of way. Yeah, it, being in Bad Brains taught me about chemistry, you know what I mean? Because, you know, we all have different chemistries, but for a long time, and for a long time, you know, like myself, Dr. No, and HR, and we all, what I'm trying to say is it was a struggle for us, but our, our a struggle for us being Bad Brains and being and doing and doing it as intense and doing it as serious as all, what you just described, you know, it's a, it was a struggle a lot of times I don't mean to like um, compare shit, but sometimes I say that like, like being in bad brains is like my like going to war or something, you know, like be, like being in like Vietnam or something. How you know what I mean? It wasn't. It's not what all people think when they see it as a band and touring and people loving you and all that stuff. But really, it's it was a struggle about unity and it was a mission, like being put on a mission. Like sometimes I would leak. Like feel like, why do I have to be this every night? You know, it, it it's a lot, you know what I mean? But plus I care. You know what I mean? It's when you when you care about something and you and it all and you're also wondering why. <laughs> you're like, I used to go in the dressing room and say, like, why couldn't we be like Dave Matthews or something? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Why the hell? 
But I would love it. It was just like, wow, wow. You know what I mean? After it even happened for us, like we would go do a show, go in the dressing room and look at each other like, wow. And sometimes why? And sometimes, <laughs> you know, so it's a mission for us, you know? Yeah. Well, and especially cause you're carving a lot of the paths that bands travel on now at that point, like, you know, pre Nirvana, pre everything touring, like, you know, you are that first wave of that. Yeah, man. And we didn't know. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. To us, we had blinders on to PMA, to Rastafari, to being who we are, knowing who we are as as men and, and artists and, you know, like dudes with the knack to play music. You see what I'm saying? So we knew that and we rode on that. But mainly riding on Unity, PMA, and feeling the um, energy from the kids and the fans and you know what I mean? That's what we rode on blindly. Like we did, if we, I, I guarantee you, if you took all the bad rates back, they would be like, no way. Cause <laughs> it was not easy. You know what I mean? It, but through the teachings of PMA and we, you know, I guess, and in, in we stuck with what we, our mission was. And, and we were blessed to recognize our brotherhood more than being in a band or some shit. Like I always used to, um, Say, like, we didn't come together like bass player wanted on the flyer in the college dorm or something. We didn't, you know, we were brothers before Bad Brains. Mm. There's people that know us and know of us as musicians in our hoods before all that saw us becoming that, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, where, yeah. where were you kind of hearing about bands like Budgie and stuff like that? Because, like, obviously, Black Sabbath is popular and Led Zeppelin are popular, but there's you know, this stuff's not necessarily being played on the radio. Like, where are you kind of discovering all this kind of stuff? That's a good question because we are, my partner and homeboy in tech and Sid McRae, right? Rest in he peace, the, yes. Yeah, he was the one, like me and him would share, like I would be playing, like he would tell me, man, I appreciate the way you, you know, show me that George Duke or, or that Return to Forever or Ma Vishnu. And then I'd be like, you put me on to Budgie or like Celtic Frost or something like that. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know what I mean? And like, uh, or like Electric Light Orchestra or something, you know, like, like, like that's Sid, but the, those bands, like the Damned, the Electric Light Orchestra, Manford Man or something. Then you got like, you know, shit that I would never, weird shit that I would never consider. And that's where Budgie came in. And Budgie too was a, a big influence on um, just that, just brain salad surgery Sometimes a song of a band can like have a great influence on them, on people, you know, not necessarily the band or their catalog or nothing about them. Mm -hmm. Maybe even the album cover in one song. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's what Budgie had on me. <laughs> and I, and I, you know, I love them. And the voices. What about like the Stooges and, and Roxy Music and any sort of that sort of precursor to punk? Like, were you aware of that stuff or was that kind of too obscure at that point even? Nah, I never really got into those groups. Mm -hmm. It's like when I started getting into it, it the wildest shit I was into was the, the shit that was on No New York album. Yes. Like, I was into that, right? I, <laughs> you know, I liked it for some reason. And, and, the, and the staples of like The Damned, The Ramones, um, Dead Boys. Yeah. Like I'm from that. Like that's why sometimes I feel I don't want to offend you know, bands from the 90s. I don't really, you know what I mean? I don't really know a lot of that mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. No, I, I totally get that. Yeah. Well, I guess like, you know, you, you brought up the Know Your New York comp and I remember reading that you, you bought, that was one of the first punk records you bought, right? Uh, Sid came over to my house with that record. Oh, he brought it over to your house. Okay, I'm just, yeah. I'm fascinated by that. Did you have any interactions with those people when you guys moved to New York a little bit later? No, I used to see them a lot. Like, uh, what's my man? Uh, Elliot Sharp and, I used to see them, you know, yeah. we, like we were in the Lower East Side. Like I used to see Basquiat walking down the street or something. You know what I mean? It's like we were in New York. It was timing. So and where we were, almost everyone that was on those albums probably was like sitting in front of, you know, I mean, it's, it was like a community. It's like nobody really like, like, oh, shit, there's Lydia Lunch or something like that. You know, did you go to see any of that stuff or was it your where were the Bad Brains in a completely different scene by that point? Yeah, by the time we started kicking in that, it's like I would see like Von Elmo, mm -hmm. you know, or I'd see like, um, or talk about the plasmatics or something, you know. I'd see like, um, like I mentioned, Elliot Sharp during this, but during that time, that stuff was starting to, it was, like we were 1980, 
You see what I'm saying? When yeah. you start seeing bad brains, you're talking like 1979 turning into 1980 yeah. is when they started to like uh, say like hardcore and stuff like that. I didn't really know. You know what I mean? To me, it was just like punk rock. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's amazing how much everything changes in that sort of like four year span, five year span. It's like it, it's just so much evolution happens in this little scene that, you know, like you're saying, by the time that hardcore rolls around, there's all these different mutations of this thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, did did my power record ever? Nah, you know, my power. It was like if you go way back before. Like being dudes in the hood that plays that play instruments, mm -hmm. we we formed a band. Or HR Doc and Earl were a couple years older than me. They already had a band that they were working on, and then I sort of appeared as the youngest one. And then HR was playing the bass, and then he switched to vocals, and then I um I filled in on bass. And then we had one song. We had one song that we wrote that I still remember to this day. It's really I should probably try to. We had, it was like riffs. It was no lyrics, really. I don't, I can't remember if it, but anyway, we had one song and by, and just like what you just said about how things change and things are changing. It's like summertime and then it's this and then it's wintertime and it's that. So we were like mind power on this like DC fusion type of dreams with one song and, and a couple cats. And then next thing you know, we're bad brains. <laughs> we never had like a show or a, or a, or nothing for mind power. All we had was a name, names for ourselves, and one song. So, how long after uh, Sid joining and taking over vocals did you switch the name to Bad Brains? Like very shortly, kind of thing. Yeah. Well, when Sid was see what happened, that's another one song situation too. Like what happened was when we first came out to want to when we first wanted to play out, we played in a basement in Maryland, mm -hmm. right and we formulated this show where Sid would would come out and we play Regulator, and then at the end of Regulator, he would start to like break shit up, like sort of like James Chance. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Remember how James Chance would like go nuts and get beat up or something? Yeah, yeah. So we we like um, you know, we was on that shit too. So at our first show or first couple shows we did, some people in the in the game were there. Um, so we play Regulator, and then. Like, you know how every band has the girl that's with them. We had a, one girl was with us. Her name was Tally, which was Sid's girlfriend. You know, we were just starting, teenagers. So we had, we had it. So, like, at the end of Regulator, Tally would run out and tackle Sid off stage. <laughs> right? And Sid, once he, he did that, Sid would, like, tear up everything and smash shit up and, you know, break chairs or whatever and leave. And it was basically, like, a little black James Chance, like, out in D.C., so. That's awesome. That's, so <laughs> yeah. That's where that came from. And then and then that was on the Sid's only song. Yeah. But the thing about Sid was that Sid was um a real like like a bondage type punk. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So he had a real sinister ideas about what it meant to be punk. And he didn't really like being pop, you know, us being popular. You know what I mean? It's like it's like it's like five people clap for you and now you're sold out. Yeah. <laughs> so did he so he only had the one song written with you guys so when hr comes in to start singing it's it's really shortly after that you're you're doing black dot so you must have written all those songs in really short order yeah some some of those songs and a lot of i was just telling telling that to my wife a lot of those riffs like almost all the first riffs are kind of written at once you know on a reel to reel wow, holy you know, just like a jam. Yeah, yeah, but it's like just <laughs> it what a what a collection of riffs that you come up with. Yeah, yeah, it's funny. Like, um, it's don't need it, right? And then it goes into um, super touch, mm -hmm. and uh, you can see, you can tell if you put those songs together, you can imagine that you know I myself, and then Doc, we could come in and you know tweak them out a little bit, and you know, and HR would be there and listening and, and getting his vibes on what he feels like he wants to say and. <laughs> And that's how you really do it, you know what I mean? You, your singer or whatever is listening to you formulate the music, and while you're doing that, he's formulating what you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's a building process. Wow, that's amazing! So you only played the one show with Sid on vocals. I think we played a basement show, maybe another basement show, and then we played one. Um, 
really pivotal show we played on the mall or something like with, with like hippies or yippies or something but it was up on like a um a, a, a flatbed stage and stuff like that it was down on the mall in dc but okay. the thing about it was it had like a ramp that you go up to go on stage you know, so yeah, we, yeah. we 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 thought we were like you know in concert or heart with some fucking somebody. <laughs> we thought we were heart when we went up on that ramp to go on that stage. Oh. And Sid played there. He 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 sang his song and did his thing on that show. So as we as we went on in life and we would laugh and talk about it, he would say, "I played that show down the mall." <laughs> like yeah. <laughs> oh, that's so awesome. What was what was the first concert that you went to? Like it doesn't have to be punk. music concert. Yeah, any music concert. Yeah. Oh, I was at James Brown at the Howard Theater in 1964. Oh my and god, I, what a yeah. show! Yeah, and I was like holding my mother's hand, looking up through the crowd, and I saw James Brown crying and stuff. And it, when I was young, after going to that show, they used to always say, "Daryl, do the James Brown," and I like do the little do whatever I you know all the little moves that I saw. Yeah. But uh, the first, yeah, that's the first stuff that I ever, show I ever went to. I was real, real young. Like, I must have been about four or five years old. They took me there to that. That's amazing. Would you go to a lot of concerts with your parents when you were younger? No, nah, not so much. I mean, down in D.C., it's like I went to, like, to see, like, BT Express and, like, mm-hmm. Jimmy Cast a Bunch and stuff like that. Like, when they would come down with, like, a cousin or something. Mm-hmm. But for the most part, once I turned, like, a teenager, I kind of, like, stayed in my hood. I, I was like that, you know, I was the only child for a long time, you know, so my sister was born when I was like 14. So for a long time, I was like in my hood, like, like that, but play, being able to play guitar and I was pretty good at the sports. Mm-hmm. You see what I'm saying? So, yeah, but yeah. playing the guitar and wanting to play the guitar and mainly just playing, playing parts of popular songs enough to make people think I could play the guitar. You know what I mean? That's what I used to do. <laughs> you know, I've played like, a, a, you know, Carry On My Wayward Son or whatever. They, they like the beginning of Stairway to Heaven. Or, yeah. I was, you know. So what were what was the first sort of rock concert that you went to or, or even like the first sort of, you know, heavier kind of music concert? Like, did you ever see Parliament? Nah, but when Parliament was big in my neighborhood and in my city, you know, Chocolate City, all that. But when they were doing that, I wasn't allowed, like my mom wouldn't let me, like it was like an exodus to the Capitol Center. For, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I, I could never, I would always be left in the hood. <laughs> you know, that kid is just sitting there, him and the other kids. <laughs> and everybody's talking about it. And like Betty Davis and all those shows. Oh, wow. But yeah. later on, I went on to see like um, Return to Free. I saw Bob Marley, mm-hmm. you know, but I didn't even, I didn't even go to see Bob Marley. I went to see Stanley Clark and I, I saw him. Like as a second thought, like why is the bass too loud? Like sitting up and <laughs> you know. Uh, but the first punk shit, I, like I used to be a fan of the Ramones, so I was actually in the crowd, like leather jacket, pole going. You know, I was back. Was that like? Was that like? Was there already kind of a DC punk scene at that point, or is that kind of the kickoff to it when the Ramones show up? Well. There was like bands playing at the ni- old 930 Club early on, you know, bands from the neighborhood, from D.C. Mm-hmm. that were already there as a scene for us to show up, for them to say, who are these black guys that mm-hmm. keep coming in the club? Like black, uh, like like the Dots, but they were from New York. Or like, I remember we opened for these bands, or like the Slicky Boys or something like that that was in D.C. Yeah. Or like, or like a band called Urban Verbs. Which, yep. was like, which was like, which was like, uh, talking heads. You know, that's how they got the same. <laughs> like, there's talking heads and there's urban verbs. Mm-hmm. Then there's yeah. swimming pool cues, right? Which is V52s. So for all the bigger bands, there's another band. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, what about like White Boy? You always hear stories about their shows being totally wild. Did you ever play with them early on? That was a. Are father- you talking? Yeah, White oh, Boy. What, the band that had I Can't Puke and it was like a father and son? Uh, in D.C.? In D.C., yeah. It might be, I, I don't know. I think you're talking about somebody. There's Root Boy Slim. Okay. Right? And, um, yeah, I don't recall any of that. No, I'm just saying you're talking like 1978 or 79 when you're mm-hmm. talking Bad Brains. Mm-hmm. Um, there's, sometimes I sit back nowadays and I think, damn, 1977, 
But 1977, I wasn't thinking nothing named punk. Like, I didn't know the Sex Pistols in 1977. Yeah. But but then I say, wait a minute. But I was in Bad Brains in 1978. <laughs> it's like, and I remember thinking about, because they had this book, 1988, I believe it was titled. It was a pic- picture book of, like, all the British punk and stuff. Yeah. I used to cut, like, pictures and make buttons out of it and stuff. Oh, that's but, awesome. Uh, I remember I used to look back and think 77, it felt like five years, but maybe it was only two. Who knows? You know what I'm saying? It's like a time warp or something. Well, that's that's the thing I'm like fascinated by because you look at what you guys did in 79. It's like, that's yeah. like one year. And you do what most bands take, it takes them like six years to do. Yeah, it took us. Yeah, man. I mean, we were serious about, it's the PMA, not so much the, the um being in a band and, it was just more about being young and understanding what it means to have a positive progression, what it means to try to focus on positivity. You know what I mean? Not so much, we're going to be a good band, but more like we're, we got to stay positive and continue our mission of what we're doing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, it's, it's also, it's, it's so funny how you change that scene, you know, like just from like, you know, like bands like Billy Synth or, or the, the, the chumps or the slicky boys and stuff. Like it's all, like it, it's 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 great stuff. Like I like it, but it just you guys show up, and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, here's where hardcore starts, you know. And then DC hardcore is, of course, this thing that's become almost like a name brand, like New York hardcore at this point. But that yeah. all starts with you guys showing up on the scene. Yeah, but they were kind of like new wave to us sometimes. Like like in our yeah. interpretation of 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 punk, they mm-hmm. were like new, you know. So basically, the uh, Madam's Organ performance space is where all that starts, where we were allowed to say we're going to get you guys to play a madam's organ and you know you're talking like seven or eight people in a living room in a brownstone <laughs> pogo and you know but for us it was like you know i always tell the story i remember when i first went to that show and henry was the one that helped us carry our equipment for the first time it made me feel like wow man i'm really you know I'm, wow you're like who would ever think there's someone that's going to help me carry my little amp that, you know what i mean no it, it's now, it's Sorry, go on. No, I'm just saying that was Henry. I always have that vision. I remember when we pulled up, and that was the guy, the guy with the um, chain belt. Well, <laughs> you say about like seven or eight, you know seven or eight people in these this living room, but it's like those seven or eight people changed music. You know, like so many bands. Like it's amazing when you look at DC, how many people come out of it and just you know go in to do other types of music, other types of you know Jeff Dolls early on in that scene. Like it just feels like it was a lot of vibrant energy. Yeah. But we wouldn't know. See, that's the next thing when stuff like that is happening. It's like if you're really close to it and you're doing it mm-hmm. and it's like it's something that's naturally happening. That's why I've been lately I've been saying this thing, the happening. You know what I mean? And I've been looking at the happening with a lot of things, music I'm doing nowadays. and Just, look, just looking at what's happening or what's trying to happen as opposed to me like trying to manipulate or guide things to what I want to see happen. So there's those things. There's what I want to see happen, and then there's the happening. Mm-hmm. You see what I'm saying? And that's what's happening. So as far as like knowing any of this, the only thing that Bad Brains knew was that we wanted to say Unity, PMA, and we wanted to play fast and energetic and tight, and we wanted to be um, inventive with our riffs. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. And that's it. We didn't want to, you know, we're not looking to be none of that really, but just that that's what we're, it's a mission for us, a PMA mission. So when you hear all our first songs, that's kind of what you hear in the lyrics. Well, you guys bring that to it, you know, like I, I remember reading something you said once about how early on, you know, Bad Brains was really about being in, you know, just what punk rock, what, what people thought punk rock was destructive, like, you know, wreaking havoc, you know, making a scene. But then at a certain point, you guys switch and bring this positivity to it that like, you know, it, it's PMA is just part of the vernacular now. And that's that's for me. Yeah, that's that's great. You know, what I mean, that's like sometimes I would, would say that's my platinum plaque or whatever, <laughs> you know, like that's what's great. You know what I mean? To be able to be used as a vehicle to like spread that vibe PMA through, they say, generations or, you know, what I mean, that's what it's all about, really. The music and all that stuff, the music and the sounds and all that's second to that. 
if you know like i remember hr used to be on stage and he would be saying we come to unite like over and over and over and over to the top of his lungs until i i'd be like yo yo chill chill you see what i'm saying so we're very he was very serious and or i'd be picking my bass till my fingers bleed you know what i mean yeah. we were very serious about it so when i look back at bad brains that's what i see i see it's driven by pma the intensity and the the uh you know wanting to achieve through positive means you know it's pma really yeah. to race those riffs down and hit those corners and it's even more pma to try to keep yourself positive when this shit, when you can't race the riffs down and you don't hit those corners you see what i'm saying yeah. the, you're getting that you're like, oh what the fuck this sucks or whatever you know what I mean? like, yeah. to, to, to say something sucks is that we felt or one of us might have felt like we didn't achieve what we said like in terms of executing our expression. Yeah. Like, I, I guess that's also what carries you through. Like you were saying those like early tours where, you know, like, what is this all for? You know, if you can keep your eye on the road and just keep going and keep positive, you can get through those tours. Like that's what carries bands to this day through tours. Yeah. The thing here is, is what we don't know that you see what I mean? Yeah. We just, just, I'm here sitting. I just turned 60. You know what I mean? So I didn't know that then. Yeah. Yeah. I just knew I was in something. I, and that's what makes it so, you know, makes it beautiful for me because I realized that we were used. And I, when I look back on the whole, like where we all came from and where we started and our families, you know, all of that. And then I see, ah, oh, this led to that. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It led to basically being who we are, creating the sound that we did, have it under a banner of peace and love and PMA, and then have it sort of start out with i guess they would say white kids or you know punks not back when we started there was no black punks mm. you know what i mean and that's why i never was really big on a lot of like i'm not when to us it was a youth movement it was nothing ever racial or anything that we could ever could ever really see and when i look back we're kind of protected from from all that you know what i mean bad brains was a an omission you know what i'm saying a divine sort of thing so during those years, like I was there in the Berlin Wall, you know, playing in Germany and, you know, when all the negative aspects of being in punk or being in rock were, were real hot and on fire. Mm. And I was there talking about PMA, blazing some, some ill shit. <laughs> and, uh, you know, basically what I'm saying is I feel we were on a mission protected. Like when people ask me about race, like being black, about being in punk, I never felt it or thought of that, not once. When I was in a club somewhere, I just was down from the bad brains or I was a youth. Like, you notice in our music, we say the youth movement, the youth of today. That's what we were when we started this. Yeah. Yeah. The and youth. Well, and you're, like you were saying earlier, it's the only, like one of the few places where as a young person, you're told that your ideas are smart and that you, you have, you know, good thoughts and that you're creative and you should put your stuff out there in the world. Like there's... As young people, you're told to, you know, wait till you grow up to do anything. Punk's like the place where it's like, no, do it now. Like, it's a youth yeah. movement, like you said. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, for to, to see it turn into, like, you know, or the slamming or the joy of, like, skanking, like, reggae after being really excited about rock. And then all of a sudden, that's about this violent, like, ability to, like, go into a, a concert and knock people out or whatever. You know, I saw it turn from, like, there was a time when we used to churn up all that energy. And then we would, we would say, damn. We got to, you know, unchurn this, you know what I mean? <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, watching the energy go from fun, loving and positive because it's physical and young turn into something like what they what they would say, something like frat boy slamming or whatever. And my vibes being involved in punk never had to do with race. It had to do with youth. You know, like, you, well, like you brought up with the slamming, too. Like you look at the 79 video of you guys playing CBGB's, CBGB's versus the 82 video of you guys playing CBGB's. Just the level of fan interaction, the level of yeah, just you know vibe in the crowd. Like it just feels like, you know, like the way you approach those sets would have to change. Like, would you ever use the reggae as a way to kind of like, kind of control the crowd's energy and just kind of like bring them down after you know? Yeah. So I used to produce the sets, the shows, and the song list and what, and I had it. Um, there was a lot of things I would consider us physically you know like and having the energy and the material and what 
You yeah. know what I mean? And as yeah. far as the, I would do it like four songs of like blistering stuff, but paced out with mid tempo stuff. Then I would throw in the reggae because not only would it calm, you know, calm, it calms us everyone down, but it still got a revolutionary feel. Yeah. But but not like the must, you know, what it takes to pick like band in DC is like a, you know, it's physical. Yeah. But so so it was like throughout. If you can rec- if you peep it throughout, it would be like four joints, a reggae, and then it would be like real popular joint, most likely mid tempo. You see, because I was considered that after we calm down the muscles and the tendons and everything and the people that's all calmed down, then if we come back with a real fire mid-tempo, then we don't have to kill ourselves out the bat. <laughs> Establish back the 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 tightness and the, uh, you know, yep. con- consistency and then pick up later because the fast songs can unravel, you know, everything like us. And everything. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. No, it, it, and it also, it, it makes the fast stuff sound even faster. You know, it just brings yeah, it. Yeah. It just, yeah, no, it's just, uh, like, it's such an art to your set construction. Just, you know, obviously I didn't get to witness yeah. it back then, but like just in live recordings and things like that, like it feels like it's interesting to hear that how much thought went into it. Yeah. Yeah. But, but a flow, a show flow, you yeah. know? Yeah. <clears throat> Were there any bands in that early DC scene that you felt like, obviously, later on with the, the younger bands that were coming up. But I mean, of those older bands that you felt were kind of on the same path that you were on or the same wavelength. Well, when I first came out for those bands, they were like big, big boys or something. You know what I mean? The band, like a slicky boys or something like that. Like, Oh, like, like, um, Tim Kane was the one that would like took us with our little demo. So to yesterday and today, you know, like they were like uh, uncles. So, I, and their music to me was sort of rock and roll and sort of new wave me being young. Mm-hmm. you know and i was into punk which is funny like i remember one time being a punk and trying to think i was sid vicious i kicked like a car's record off a turntable <laughs> in, in someone else's apartment <laughs> <laughs> like, you see what i mean like why are they playing this shit and then it's and it turns out rick Ocasek. but that's like back in the days when you think like you know, when you, when you say disco sucks and it means something to you. Yeah. So for me to like think the cars, ah, that's new wave. So basically a lot of those groups that, are, that were in D.C. to me were sort of new wave and we were kind of punk. But um, Slicky Boys and them were like pro, you know, I subliminally pick up on their like pro style, you know, the way they look or the way they do a show. You know, all that stuff sinking into a, a teenage cat like me, like getting it going uptown to get into that scene you see what i mean i had to go somewhere i was from from southeast dc from the hood Mm -hmm. so to go uptown and be up in the 9 30 club and peeping out a a, um band like slicky boys or i keep bringing them up because they're mainly the ones that stick out in my head And, and and when i think why why that is is because um i was too they were a lot of them back then it's new wave you see what i'm saying i'm mm-hmm. in the punk mm-hmm. well, and yeah. it seems like the dc stuff as opposed to like the punk stuff that's going on in new york like with the dead boys and and you know obviously stuff that would come after that but like it just feels like like you're saying the stuff in dc prior to you guys again is just a lot more yeah new wave like it doesn't have yeah. it's not like aggressive right it's, it's just not really punk yet yeah you know and i think by us listening to the imports and wanting to be punk and the damned and all that by going to New York where it's basically the same thing as in DC, but it's more felt more drug and more big city, New York, where you got like uh Max's and you got like, like Johnny Thunders or whatever walking down the street. Yeah. You, know, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's different. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. Uh, you know, one thing that gave me a lot of pride as a kid growing up in Toronto was when I found out that you covered the Vile Tones early on because they're obscure here. Like, no one in Canada knows this band. And to find out that they, you know, were at all in the the stew that became the Bad Brains. Like, I just wondered how you first became aware of that band and where you got that single and all that kind of stuff. So Sid, you see, he goes up to yesterday in the day's records and he probably stole the record. <laughs> Right. Because, yeah. you know, it's, it's, he stole the 45, came back to Southeast. And uh, it, it was just more because notice how I said Sid was a bondage type punk. Yep. Yep. So now you think of the vile tones, uh, screaming fists. Yep. You see how I so say you got the you got the bondage punk, black punk, 
in Southeast. He goes to yesterday, the day's record up in Rockville, Maryland, steals Vile Tones, probably because of their name or their album or their 45 cover. Yeah. All right. Bring it, bring it home, put it on. It sounds like a, what I describe as like biker music or something. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, it's, it's like churning, but it's, it's, it's rough. Right. Yep. yep. And that's what probably made me churn a little bit the way that I like to feel about if I'm making some, I went on to call it like, I might say, I'm going to make me some biker type shit, like the vile tones. You see what I mean? Where it's yeah. not that it's this driving like motorhead was a little bit like that, but motorhead was a little too fast. <laughs> you gotta be churning it out. Awesome. <laughs> She's making me laugh. Thinking about it. Oh, that's so awesome. You talk about this stuff. You don't know how yeah, long I want to yeah. talk to you about this. Oh. Yeah. So oh. vile tones. Yeah. And Toronto too, you know, the real jerk, all that. Oh, amazing restaurant, The Real Jerk. Absolutely. Um, yep. it, it's it's a, another artist that I've always wondering if you had any interaction with, because I think he's a few years later, is Richard Sims, who played under Wicked Witch. Oh, no. Nope, I don't know nothing okay. about that. I think, he, I think he might have been after you had moved and left to New York, which, uh, you know. You brought oh, him, from he, D.C.? Yeah, from D.C. Oh, I might, you know, be honest with you. I probably, that dude could have been my best friend. I felt, <laughs> I felt like I forgot, you know, I forgot a lot of that, you know, unfortunately, you know, some, some stuff like the other day, I, I think I did an interview and I said that the pay to come ly- um, title didn't have anything to do with the lyrics. Yeah. But I don't think that's true. I, <laughs> I, I as I thought about it more and I realized that what was, what was, was I, the, the pay to come title goes with the lyrics, but I changed the spelling being a punk kid. Oh, okay. Change it, change the spelling from C O M E to C U M. Yeah. Just to change it to be like a knucklehead punk kid. <laughs> well, that's the thing is like you've done so much living since these things I'm talking to you about. You know, it's just, uh, I appreciate you uh, racking your brain thinking about this stuff because. It's such a short period of time. Like, I know I keep saying it, but like, really, when you think about, you know, this sort of like three or four year span, let like, changes music forever. And you, you arrive in New York and you talk about seeing Basquiat walking down the street. Like you've got, yeah. you've got like the birth of, of, of art, hip hop, skateboarding, punk rock, graffiti, hardcore, all of it happening in the same city at the same time. Yeah. I remember when I used to see Basquiat, right? I couldn't understand him because that was like, I was like a Rasta, just young Rasta man. Like imagine like Peter Tosh, like 19 or something. You know, I was like, I was straight Rasta, you know, at, at 20 and 21. And I used to see him and he had dreads. Right. You remember, you know, Basquiat mm-hmm. got dreads. Oh yeah. Yeah. But to me, if you had dreads back in that time, to me, I couldn't understand this dude. It was kind of didn't wasn't with us, like us. <laughs> you know what I yeah. Mean? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I was just saying, just mainly speaking to like grow, you know, like what we're talking about the times. You know what I mean? Like in New York, not even from D.C. You notice I know more about what happened in New York than as far as that sort of stuff than the band, the people you mentioned that were in D.C. I don't really in D.C. I know Urban Verbs, Slicky Boys, Judy's Fixation. Mm-hmm. Uh, they had one called um, a metal band called like Rock Candy or something like that. <laughs> That's all, you know what I mean? But I was like 18 or 19 years old, just starting to like be Daryl. And uh, I didn't really know that much, a lot of that stuff. Well, it's funny because like from people I've talked to and people who have been on the show from DC, it's almost like you guys plant the seed and then move to New York. And then the seed kind of blooms while you're in New York. Yeah, you see, the key with that is people sort of maybe need to understand that us being under the, the the influence of Think and Grow Rich and, and PMA and Napoleon Hill during that time it, it 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 taught us that when you start to like conquer something, you gotta move on. Mm-hmm. So we left DC to move on because we were doing our thing in DC. Like you probably heard me say, like the band in DC is not no one banned us in DC. That's like a song we put to once we started playing and people started coming a lot and the club owners are upset you know the, the chandeliers are shaking or what have you yeah. and then we start to think in our pma minds it's time for us to go you know and that's how you can get like a, a hometown hero you know like i love to kim kane and slicky boys and all that but i think they may have fell prey to that mm-hmm. you know they needed to leave they needed to leave but 
you know, DC's DC culture. It's like Washingtonian. You see, you notice with Ian and all them dudes, you know, it's a lot of Washingtonian in that. Yeah. Bad Brains is universal <laughs> from Washington, from Washington. Yeah. No, and, and it's like you were saying, you, it's almost like you had to go to New York to kind of kick, to plant the seed there because that's what kind of happened. Well, we went to New York because we learned through PMA that once you conquer something, move on. You don't stay right there in your victory. You see what I'm saying? And that's what that's all about, going to New York. That's what it's all about. Nothing about no gigs or no shows or nothing like that. It's about knowing and positive progression that once you conquer something, move on and conquer the next. You know what I'm so, saying? So you, you guys got to you know, go to New York. Is it the first time you go to New York in 79 and play CBGBs? Yeah, or maybe tier three. Okay. Like, yeah. Yeah. And and so what were your impressions of kind of coming to the city? Because it's an interesting period for New York. Like it's pre it's kind of post punk being this huge thing and pre, you know, New York hardcore really starting to go in or that next wave of New York hardcore. So what were your impressions of the city and the scene when you kind of got there? Man, it was like like I was on the Bowery, you know, when it was the real Bowery, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> it was like, 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 like what people, you know, the Bowery, like bars, like Valentine and drunks laying around. And I used to think like Uptown was like St. Mark's, just to give you an idea of like coming from another city and coming out the Holland Tunnel and, and going up to get near CBGB's mm -hmm. and sort of staying in that area. So it was like a big city, like, struggle. If anybody knows New York back then, then they know what I'm talking about as far as, you know, downtown and all the stereotypes that go, you know, like the dope and Avenue C and death is D and all that shit's real. Yeah, you know what I mean? And, like, uh, you know, the clubs and, the, and, the, and, the, and CBGBs and, it, and, you know, Hells Angels and Gilder Sleeves and the Mad and over at Max's with all the, the drug sort of groups. You know, I can only just paint a picture of what, if anyone was in New York back in like the late seventies and early eighties. And I'm sure before that I'm from DC, I'm not from New York. So dudes would tell me, dude, you should have been there in 77 or six. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. So New York was dark, dirty, but really for me, being a teenager coming up there, New York was about CBGBs, point blank. I didn't care. I'd sleep on the floor. I sell loose joints out in front. You know what I mean? Yeah. It was all about bad brains and CBGBs. It's the only reason why I was there. You know? Was was the first time you went there when you played there? Yeah. I never never went there. And and, and when we played CBGBs, the dude Merv um, that used to be there that they show him in the movie with the with the hard hat on. Mm -hmm. They, they were all really nice to us. And Hilly would tell the Hells Angel to leave us alone and they, they would let us in for free. And one other thing I remember about playing for the first time at CBGB's, when we first played there, it was like, I think it was a Tuesday or a Monday. And then after we played that Monday, then Hilly moved us to a Thursday. Then after we played that Thursday, he moved us to like Thursday and Friday. It was like we were wilding it out. And this is where CB's had like uh, theater um, chairs in it, like you know. And that's what I was saying. Like me and Doc, and all of us would like, you know, we're a band in in, in New York. We're broke. We're we're strictly a band, and we would like sell joints. And like I would go downtown, buy a nickel bag, knock that down to fifteen joints, sit in front of CBGBs and go loose joints for people going in. And then once I got my money, I'd have a nickel for my own weed. I'd buy a 40 ounce brew, me and Doc. We'd buy like a Mac cheese and find some place to cook it. Yeah. Eat it. Go back to CBGB's because <laughs> we could go in for free, you see. Yeah. And then go in and sit up on the front row of those theater seats that they had and put our feet on the stage and watch all the bands that we play. <laughs> and some of those bands, like, like there was a band called the Bloodless Pharaohs. And that's um, the dude... That's seltzer or whatever from the Stray Cats. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. So people would never know that that dude is like a sick guitar player, like um, like, like, like Al Demiola or something, like, like, like Ma Vishnu. <laughs> that dude in the Stray Cats, I've seen him in a band called Blood is Pharaohs before. When I saw them playing Rockabilly, I was like, what the hell happened to him? <laughs> but sitting in there in those theater seats with my feet on the stage, right? And there's a lot of bands that I saw, like I mentioned that one, the swimming pool cues. 
Mm-hmm. And they were from Georgia, and they were the other B-52s. Like, exactly the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, they get going right away. Like, uh, I, Fred from B-52s was just on the other week, and he was talking all about them being like, they were like the next wave after them, and like the little brother band, I guess. Yeah, and that's why, you know, that's what I'm saying. I saw a band from Georgia called the Swimming Pool Cues that were kind of doper than B-52s. But, you know, I don't know what happened to them. You know, it, it just showed me, you know, one, how, like, the type of blinders that I must have had, you know, had on or we had on being bad brains. Because as I got older, I would think back and look back. Like, I remember when the Chili Peppers came and opened up for us at um in L.A. at the lingerie. I thought they were, like, the... Um, couldn't understand how they got on the bill because they were kind of like making fun, you know, they felt like a frat boy sort of thing. Like, yeah. Like funk group. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's a, uh, amazing story I heard from uh, about Pat smear, uh, getting a call when he was working at SST records from them. And they're like, Hey Pat, uh, we want to know if you want to play guitar for the chili peppers. And this is before blood sugar, sex magic, but they're still popular. And mm-hmm. he's like, um, you guys still playing that funk stuff? Yeah. You know? exactly. And they're like, yeah. He's like, oh, I'm good. <laughs> and just he's like, hangs up. He's yeah. like, ah, I, I could do without that. Thanks. Ain't that something? <laughs> yeah. You know? And, and even my even my homies, my little homies, the Beastie Boys. Like I saw, like I saw when like rap star, you know, I saw that. And I'm like, man, you guys making fun of the rap stuff or whatever. It's like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it's it, it's amazing how that stuff gets taken up differently. Yeah. Years later. Yeah. Yeah. Um, going back to, you know, coming into New York, you mentioned the mad and that seems like a band that you really kind of, you know, like obviously the drummer becomes your manager for a time. And, and you mentioned mm-hmm. uh, screaming mad George, like, was that the band that you kind of fell in with closest? Would you say? Yeah. We lived with them. Like they let us stay there. You know, you, like we were seriously uh, four dudes that took off to New York with no, nowhere to go and nowhere to live. So yeah. we would live day to day, like not, you know, and I never wound up not sleeping on the bench, like in Thompson Square Park. But we seem to have, you notice how I said we would find a place to cook the mac cheese and stuff, you know. <laughs> yeah. we would, it was a constant, like, looking for a place to, you know, cook or maybe shower. And So Screaming Mad George let us stay up in this place. And, yeah, that's where I, that's where I remember writing um, Stay Close to Me. And, um yeah, man, Georgie and, and and him and his like special effects and all that stuff. Well, yeah, that's the thing is he goes on to become you know one of the most respected special effects guy. Does like the Reanimator movies. I know. I never. I'm not even tuned in all the way on that yet. It's you so. What I mean, on. yeah, no, no, I don't blame you because you obviously you know you were doing your own thing, but it's just amazing once again out of this scene, you know. And I've always I've seen all these great yeah. videos of them. He used to do like special effects on stage, right? Yeah, man, some of the freaky. I used to watch him make that shit, like putting it. Th- like one time I saw him, he had he was making like <laughs> he was making shit, right? He had like peanut butter and all this stuff. He was putting in a plastic bag, and the Ziploc was gonna put it in his back of his pants. And then he had like he was making it so he had like four arms, right? He had two other arms that were like a puppet, and he went to do the show at Max's, and then he was bugging out doing his screaming at George shit, and he reached into his pants and pulled out that. That shit. I was like, you're nuts, dude. <laughs> but I remember that shit, though. But that's my man, man. God bless him, and I love him. He, if it wasn't for the Mad and Screaming Mad George and Dave Hahn and and those dudes, God knows, because like you know that was where that was where we could go, mm-hmm. like you know what I mean, being from DC and not have to go home. Yeah. You know? Yeah. No, absolutely. Um, uh, you know, you talked about him earlier. You mentioned the dots and Jim, Jimmy from the dots. Once again, rest in peace. He produced um, the first single, right? Yeah. Yeah. Now, when he, they were the dots, play, that they played at the old 930 club. And it's like, I don't know. They felt like dead boys or something a little bit. Mm-hmm. But uh, I don't, you know, I was really young during that time. And my bigger brothers was kind of handling getting to know them and recording with him. But um, from what I can remember, just like Rick Ocasek, um, they heard of us or heard or saw or did something and, and, they, and they saw us and they said, yo, let me record you guys. And for us, it's just like, you know, we've got to remember, we're just like a, the lowest, you know, we're just some dudes from, from out, in, out in D.C., out in Maryland. And uh, 
you know, it was great to like people were picking up on our energy or our, our, our drive and wanting to step in and help us. So, yeah, we recorded Pay to Come, Stay Close to Me up in New York and some shit that was looked like was called the Money Building, the mm-hmm. Money Building. And uh, we had a single. <laughs> it was like, oh, shit. And we sat around a table and glued the sleeves together and got our high school buddy claims he was a printer. And, you know, <laughs> go. But it's like a thousand... You know, it's a, one of the most important records of all time. You know, like as far as seven inches go, like that was, you know, it's it's perfect. It's like a perfect record. Yeah, I didn't know. I don't know. I don't know why I knew Pay to Come, but the other B side, which I wrote that song, and I, it's a, you know, it's another story on how I came up to even want to write something like that. But it it's it's kind of like Clash influenced in a way. Now, if you go back and listen to it, so the Clash was having a a big influence on us with the rock against racism and, uh, and you know, being like the clash. So stay close to me. is kind of a clash influence song. Pain to come is a, is a Ramon, a Ramones influence song. And they all, they're, but they're perfect too. Like you were saying about the live set, like you want to have that balance. Like, I think it's such a, yeah, uh, it's like a perfect dichotomy. Right there. I don't know. Now, if it was me, I would have probably, if I had to go back in time, I wouldn't have put Pay to Come on the other side. I probably would have put like How Low Can a Punk Get or something. Okay, yeah. You see, so, so it's like a happening. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. That happened. Yeah. It's, a, it's reasons why that went down like that. But if I had to do it again, I would have never thought like, put put this song on there. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, like you're saying, it's like that causal relationship where things just seem to like everything leads to something else. And if this thing didn't happen, then all these events yeah. that come after wouldn't have been able to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what about Jerry Williams? Like, when was the first time you saw the cigarettes? And did was that when you met him seeing that band first? Nah, uh, that's a good question, man. Wow, that's a good question. How the hell we wind up down there at 171A? Uh, uh, I think we might have been walking up and down the street and heard music, guitars coming from out of there. And, you know, and the rest is history. Yeah. <laughs> like, I think that's what happened. I don't think we saw the cigarettes or anything. I think just being down on the Lower East Side and then, Jerry had that space. And so we wound up probably going in there maybe with um Dave Hahn or somebody and and then uh we just like I remember the cigarettes, but Jerry he used to be weird, like he'd be wearing that um scuba outfit and what have you. He used to be sweating and shit. I'm like, what the hell? I missed that dude. That was my dude. But he would like, you know, he would like um, you know, we would smoke weed and it was just like a, a little club, a little family of rockers that was building down there with us and and you know like the stimulators and harley and everybody it was a great time yeah and it's really like the foundation of like that next scene that's going to start like the the quote-unquote capital h new york hardcore thing that starts yeah. next i don't really know nothing about that and i feel bad because i feel bad because i can't really speak on it like a lot of kids come to me down i'm from so-and-so i'm from so-and-so and the only thing I could say is, dude, I don't even barely even even know like one Fugazi or nothing, you know. <laughs> yeah. You see what I'm saying? I don't know all that. I'm from the damn. You gotta holler at me about nine 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 or fucking buzzcocks or something, man. I don't know none of the other stuff. Well, and also, I, th- I think it's because you're too busy influencing all the other stuff that's happening, right? Like it's you guys are already kind of going as a band. I find once people become once it becomes your vocation in your life. You, you you can't stay attached to the scene in the same way that you were able to before that, I find. Yeah, but I never was paying attention, really, you know, to other bands. Hmm. Um, to me, it's just all about busting the set. You see what I'm saying? To me, it's all about busting the set. And, and to me, it's like, like a football team or something that practices on in a week. They're going to go this way, that way. You're going to hit the hole, all that. That's what I'm thinking in terms of bad brains busting that set. Mm-hmm. Like when we come out with this, kick into that, kick into this, kick that. Like I need, it, it meant a lot to me like to execute. And I would get real, you know, I'd get bummed out if I couldn't do it because mainly just based on someone wanting, like can you see like a fighter or a boxer saying I didn't stick to the game plan or, or I got too happy or I got too this or too that. Mm-hmm. So it was In terms of executing anything, you know what I mean? Not much, much less punk rock. But to me, it was about execution. So we rehearse or we come up with something and we put it together. They say, we're going we're gonna to bust it out here at this place. We go to that place. I wait for everybody to stop doing what they're doing. 
And then I get up there and I, I like, all right, let's go. Like a football team when they go up there and before they say, hut, hut. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> when they come up on the line and shit. You dig what I'm saying? You look yep. at, imagine this fine tune, like, hut, hut, bang. And everybody hit the hole. This guy does that. This guy does that. Yeah. That, that's what I was doing to make, I guess when people say, as I look back and, and my brothers and us together were doing to execute our, bust our set or our songs and present our, our idea. Like we didn't get lost in rock and roll. We never jam. You see what I'm saying? That's that's pretty pretty wild. What I just said. We didn't get lost in rock and roll. I love it. I love that. Line. How about that? How about that? Huh? <laughs> Very true. Like we, it, we never got lost in rock and roll. Yeah. And we never jammed. So you guys only were, time we would only time we jam is on the reggae. We never jammed hardcore or rock. Wow. So you never practiced those songs. It was just from playing live that they were that tight. It's from rehearsing them, coming up with them, understanding the corners and, and execution of them, and then being brothers and getting up there with one mission and busting it. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? And then if we couldn't bust it for whatever reason, there's a lot of reasons they come in why it's hard to bust. There's a lot of reasons, a lot of things. You see what I'm saying? Factors that over the years we learn how to deal with, like a stage dimensions or, or monitors or, or, you know, a lot of little things that can when you're doing something as fast paced and as energized and as demanding as busting bad brains, you know, to do it. But that's when I learned about chemistry, you know, not sometimes things that seem like they're imperfect or not so perfect. in that is actually making a stronger, uh, a more muscular expression. You see what I'm saying? Like, like shit too tight might be too sheer. You see yeah. what I'm saying? And shit that's not as tight as you envisioned or what you think, or maybe with a little, bump here and there actually and even more so out in the crowd coming through a pa it's like another whole thing it's like a stew or something you know yeah well it's like you're saying it's like that it's you have to ride that line like you want it to be tight but you don't want it to be too virtuosic that sounds like some guy on youtube just yeah. jamming in his room but it can't be tight so people what i'm saying i could i could want it to be like i always said i always said later on if it was left up to me the bad brains probably would have sounded like metallica <laughs> You see what I'm saying? If it was left up to me because of the way that the riffs that I wrote them and what I was envisioning, yeah, right? What I envisioned for the riffs. But then when I got with my brothers, maybe, all, you know, everybody's different and everybody, and that's what could have caused frustration. But then as you grow more mature and your ear develops, you start to understand what chemistry is. And then you start to appreciate the chemistry and you stop feeling less connected to your interpretation of art, you see what I'm saying? So it took me being a tight ass about wanting everything to be tight. My brothers wanting shit to be tight too, but maybe their tight's different than mine. Yeah, yeah. You see what I'm saying? Which I hear now later when I when I listen back. But then what that does is cause a little friction, a little, it causes friction. And then now if you've got something as fast paced and as energized and as, as mission oriented as bad brains, and now you gotta add a little friction to <laughs> I laugh at my own shit, kid. <laughs> oh, I, I love this. And Daryl, I've kept you forever. Would you come back yeah, at some man. point and do a part two? I could, man. I never really did this. This is a podcast, right? Yeah, it's a podcast. And I, I'm not and I'm I'm not hurting you off the phone. If you still want to talk, I'd love to talk. Oh, no, no. I could talk to you forever. But the thing is, is that, you know what I mean? I don't want to come off. You know what I mean? I just want people talking to you. I don't know. I've been quarantined. You know what I'm saying? I'm just saying, I don't know what the hell. I'm telling you what I feel and what Dude, I know. Dude, no, this is amazing. It's honestly, yeah. it, I'm not, you know, it's like, I'm not blowing smoke with this at all. Like, this is a dream come true. And just hearing you talk about the stuff, the way you're talking about, like, hearing you talk about how how much you like The Damned. Like, that to me is so badass. And yeah, you, that's one of my favorite groups, man. Oh, uh, me too. I love that band. And they seem like they were a band that, like, had a role in your journey, too. Like, like not a role, but you guys intersected yeah. with them. More the damned like that bring that brings to mind this. There's a few people out there that that I know that are prominent or whatever, and some every now and then they want to try to tell me bad brains is dope, but they're black flag. See what I'm saying? Like some people, I'll be like, man. So I say that in my era, the Ramones is dope, but I'm the damned. Yeah, yeah. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. The Ramones is dope. I'm not going. The Ramones is the dope, dopeness, but I am the damned. You see what I'm saying? The way I like the way the damn was kicking their shit. 
And we went on to like have some experience. Like they was going to take us on tour. You see what I'm saying? That's how we wound up, went to England and got deported and all of that because we opened for them at um, in D.C. At, the, at this club called The Bayou. And they were really impressed with us and they offered to take us on tour. Mm-hmm. And we sold all our equipment. We didn't have equipment and we had no money and we bought tickets. Back then, I think it's like Freddie Laker Airline or some shit back then. <laughs> and um, we arrived in London and went through um, customs. And as we went through customs, they denied us entry and then took us and put us in this shit called like the Beehive or something. It's like out in the middle of the airstrip. And they kept us there all day. And then when the flight going back to New York, they, they gave our um, passports to the pilot. I told him, don't give us our passports till we land back in New York. So I'm just telling a short, quick story about how the Bad Brains opened up for the dam. They said, damn, Rat Scabies, we want to take you all on a tour. We sold all our gear. See, this is what people got to peep when they think about certain shit. Like, we still, how are you going to go doing a tour with no gear? Yeah, yeah. All right, but we said, we're going. We'll figure the gear when we get there. This is how we figure this. We sell the drums. Earl just bought those drums himself, working. And we sold those drums, and we sold, and our guitars got stolen in front of our faces. So we landed in um, there, and I was the only one that got through, actually. You know, I, I was the only one. I was the youngest one. And the lady asked me if I had money. I had, like, I had two dimes and two pennies. Yeah. You know, I didn't have any money. I remember I reached in my pocket, but by the time I went to show her or tried to say I didn't have any money, she stamped my passport. So, but here's the funny story about that. Rat Scabie's father had a wooden hand, and he came down to um, try to get us out, and he couldn't. And so we got, but his father, I always remember that, that he had like this wooden hand. Oh, that, how long was that tour supposed to be? Was it just a couple shows or was it like a full tour? No, I have no idea. That's again, like HR or doc, like a bigger brothers back yeah. in that time would, yeah. would know more about that. Yeah. It, it's, they're, like you said, they're amazing. And they just seem like a band that kind of gets like, almost like, like you're saying, like, it's like the Rolling Stones and the Beatles, but they're like the who, like they're the band yeah. that's like. The, the band that never really gets brought up, but the band that just seems like, like well, they're just so good. They're just so yep, good. Yeah, yeah. So big up to them, you know? Yeah. And Ratscapey seems like someone who got it. Like the fact that he would see you guys and know, oh yeah. shit, we got to do something with these guys. I don't think I ever saw him again. Um, maybe once. It was weird. It's like we never really, I don't think I saw them again. You know? Well, yeah. Well, before I let you go, I, one thing I would love to ask you about, um, and as I say, this has been incredible, would be that the, the Bond shows that you did with The Clash, because those shows are yeah. you know, so legendary, and I just wanted to find out from your memories what they are, what, what the reality was like versus the legend. All right. <laughs> but the, I owe the Ram- Ramones and them this. When we opened up for the, for the Clash, we, and I never would say this about the Bad Brains, and I'm not, I don't boast Bad Brains. Trust me, it's not in my nature. But Bad Brains, in the, the height of our doing whatever we do with our music and our styles, we kind of blew them off stage that night. Oh, I, I don't doubt that for a second. Yeah. All right. And what happened was, and then Dave Hahn was backstage in the, in the production office and said that Don Letts was on the phone to London and said these urban black punks just destroyed the stage. <laughs> right. And Dave Hahn heard him say that. So these are my heroes. Right, the clash or one of them. So when I went out after that set, they kicked me out from backstage. And they made me stand on the other side of the uh velvet rope or whatever. What? For the rest of the Yeah, and then I was standing there, my heart was broken. Yeah. And I watched them walk by to go on stage and they all looked like Barbie dolls or something. <laughs> you know, they they had their collars were starched up, you know, they were the clash, they were starched, they and ever since then, I kind of always felt like, you know, but I always felt like, yeah, y'all got smoked. But I never would say that about the, <laughs> the bad braids. But they definitely got smoked. I know I've been there to clash. So after a while, nobody even knew we were there. But to come out and start turning that up, they knew that it was a problem. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and, all, and also, the Ramones did the same thing, but even worse. So we're opening up for them in your country. At some shit called the Infest or something like that. I don't know if you heard it or remember no. back in the day. So we're in Canada and we're opening up for for the Ramones 
I've never seen we're a flyer all... for the show. Where, where, where was, do you remember where it was in Canada? Uh, it was called the Infest. It, not, it was in the Western. I seem to remember. Okay. I can't remember vaguely, and it might not even been. It could have been uh, like Seattle or something. But I'm, but I, I, I feel it's Canada. It's called Infest. Okay, I'm gonna look it up. Uh, definitely. Yeah, yeah. So we're playing. We're we're all, and it's outdoors, mm-hmm. and we're kicking it, and then we get to the last song, is Reignition. So we we crunching Reignition. The people are going nuts. All of a sudden, the whole stage goes like bloom black. The shit is like ding, 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 ding. All the amps, everything. <laughs> right? So I'm wondering, what the hell? Get this. I run off stage. What the fuck happened? The promoter said, the Ramones said, if they didn't, if we didn't get you off stage right now, that they're going to go back to the airport and go back to New York. What? <laughs> <laughs> what a bunch of assholes. Oh, Can my. you believe that? They cut us off during the song. Uh, I, I will definitely say I'm not defending them at all with this, but also at the same time, there is no band that I would fear playing after more than you guys. I could not <laughs> yeah. imagine yeah. sitting backstage and being like, Sheena is a punk rocker is not going to cut it tonight. <laughs> yeah, but if you wait, if you keep kicking it, no one's going to know we're there. This is one thing I learned about bands that actually did good opening up for us. Yeah. And, and popular bands that I'm thinking, damn, this place is going bananas, right? It's like, how do we stand up to this? And what I learned about that was it doesn't matter if you're headlining, you're going to get juice because eventually the whole energy of the show turns towards you. No matter how dope you are, Mm -hmm. you could be killed. You know, there's an exception. If you get killed, killed, killed. Yes. But if you're just getting killed by by the time that headliner hits you with those lights and all that shit. Yeah. You know, it's different. Yeah. Right. Like the PA is louder. Everything about it. Louder. The attention. But they might ha- they might take a while. Like th- this happens a lot with like James Brown and Prince and stuff like that, and like and like Rick James and you know the Rolling Stones. You know, with somebody like really strong, and they go, "Oh, these dudes, we can't deal with this every night," because you know. Mm. But it shouldn't be that way. And Bad Brains was never that way, and that's why, like like Big Brother HR, we used to always involve everybody in everything we did. You know what I mean? And you can ask anyone that knows us when we come to your town. If you want to come on stage or you want to meet us or you want to play for us or open up or whatever, we're down. We were a real community type band, mm-hmm. you know? Well, and it goes back to what you're saying. Like, that's, I, you know, what we've been talking about. Like, that's what you guys brought to hardcore is this idea that this is community and this is like PMA, you know? And that's what gets yeah. you through when you're, when you're, when you have a band that's opening for you that's really good or you're opening and you're trying to be good. If you're just positive and in your own shit, you can do it. And see, people should understand that that came from like Maurice White, from Earth, Wind, and Fire. That came from Big Brother HR, being a being a little brother to Maurice White, and this whole way, you know. So with Bad Brains and our and our generation and our our situation is Big Brother HR carrying the torch of PMA and getting us to like, you know, what I mean, stay on the PMA track. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, anytime you want to come back here and dig through these memories, please know, Daryl, <laughs> yeah. you're always welcome. Appreciate it, Damien. Thank you, Daryl, for coming on the show. And you heard right there, hopefully, Daryl will be back at some point in the future for a part two because that's one of the best episodes ever. I, 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 like, I, <laughs> I had to stop this thing several times while listening back to it. Uh, you know, just because I was like, oh, this is too good. I I don't want to rush the edit of this thing. Uh, that's it though for, uh, that, I I guess. Yeah. Check out the bad brains, check out anything Daryl Jennifer's involved in. He's been involved in a lot of really cool projects and continues to be involved in a lot of really cool projects. All right. Uh, that's it, I guess. Okay. On to next week on the show. Uh, we got to keep it going. We got to keep this energy going, right? So how about a part two week? Next week will be uh, two part twos. Kicking it off with Joey Keithley, Joey Shithead, part two. Uh, and this is a fun one, you know? And uh, like, if, if Bad Brains are the best live band of the era, DOA is number two. Uh, because they are the band that gets talked about constantly as being, you know, the other band that would come to town and just destroy stages. So... We get into all of that stuff next week with Joey. It's a really fun conversation and a great kind of follow-up to this one. It really does uh, go really well with this one. So that's it. Oh, 
Oh, I'm excited. How am I going to go to sleep now? I got to, got to get a couple hours of sleep somehow. Oh, well, that's it for me. Uh, remember as always black lives matter, the lives of indigenous people matter. Uh, we need to protect trans kids and we need to help trans people protect themselves. Uh, research, uh, read, get involved, uh, you look into organizations and groups that are doing good work right now. See if you can donate time or money or, or, you know, whatever. Basically the long and the short of it is, is smash fascism, you know, like f- fuck Nazis, like legitimately, we don't need them at all in this world. Uh, it, it, Sign your organ donor cards, please go and do that because by the time they come looking for those organs, you don't need them anymore. And it, it gives gifts to other people. And I can speak from, uh, uh, you know, a family experience of someone getting an organ transplant and, you know, it gave them a, a, a new, not even a new lease on life, just like life, you know, it really, really was an incredible gift for someone to do. So please sign your organ donor cards, uh, go out in there and make your own culture, you know, start a, start a fanzine, start a, do whatever you need to do, start something. And, and just, you know, you don't even have to put something out in the world. Just draw a picture, draw a picture for yourself. Just do something creative and it helps. It helps with your mental health. It helps with a lot of stuff. So try it. Try meditating too. I'm, I'm a recent convert to this thing. Those hippies, they have magic and uh, meditation is the latest that I've un discovered for myself that seemingly the world has known for years, but, uh, yeah, try it. You know, it it helps. Uh, and that's it. Uh, I think that's all I got, right? Yep. That's it. Oh, listen to oil and flowers with myself and Buddha blaze. We talk about cannabis. It's a fun podcast and, uh, that's it. All right. See ya next. Oh, check out, check out punk as fuck over at flood magazine. Definitely, uh, floodmagazine.com. Check out, check out punk as fuck. Some hilarious videos of me going around LA talking to people about punk rock. And, uh, yeah, definitely check those out. Okay. That's it. Thank you everyone for listening. I'll see you next episode.